Uh, we're going to have Arthur Clark. And Arthur, um, I mean, this guy went to Caltech, the top university in the world, according to um, Times Higher Education poll. And we know Caltech is a home for Sheldon and Leonard. Does anyone know? I, I think um, Big Bang Theory, if you watch that, uh, I'm not sure how their basketball team's doing or their football team, but th that talk about uh, mental academics. And I think Arthur maybe was the first iteration of Big Bang Theory. So he'll tell you some stories about what they invented on string theory. And, and, um, um, and he actually was named, I believe, uh, in 2007. Are you the co-owner of the Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. OK. I, I, yeah, I don't have that on my resume. Um, and, and the other part, he went to MIT. So he went to the number one school in the world and then the number five school. I don't know which one happened first. So uh, pretty impressive. And, and by the way, Caltech has uh, is alumni uh, 32 Nobel laureates. And so I guess you're part of that, right? So other than that, I don't have any car stories or music stories. But uh, welcome, welcome to the stage and, and look forward to your presentation. Okay, uh, I don't have too much time. I have uh, 19 minutes and 55 seconds. So anyway, uh, I, uh, I think the, uh, the Big Bang Theory thing, it's uh, certainly a good in intro. Uh, I, know, I, I, mean, I know that uh, you know, the school is uh, fantastic. It's small, but, uh, but it really is. Uh, it's kind of like that. What kind of conversation do you have with friends there? When I went there as a as a graduate student, uh, it, it's kind of like that. Kind of very nerdy, um, and but <laughs> uh, but I wasn't a comic book guy. But I, I was uh, I was very much into uh, into uh, into doing experiments, so all sorts of experiments. So anyway, uh, without further ado, let me uh, just say that uh, my uh, my my claim to fame at uh, the Chevron has a lot to do with. Ah, there we go. Has a lot to do with uh, the fact that uh, I, d I was part of this uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change, and the IPCC, that's what it's called, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, really is a, uh, is a, is a process. It's not, it's not like it's an institution or building with, uh, full of scientists. It really is a process that takes place every, every five to six years. And the latest process, the so-called fifth assessment process, of which I also played a, uh, played a small role. Um, I, I actually pay, played a role beginning in third, the third assessment process and then the fourth assessment. And, uh, and in these processes, it's really you are nominated by your government, your national government. In my case, of course, is the U U uh, United States Department of State uh, to be part of the US delegation of scientists and technologists, economists, people like that to, to actually write or review, or in some ways uh, even edit the um, the IPCC report. So this this is a process that takes a long time, and uh, for which um, in 2007 it was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, half of it to uh, to the IPCC. And so in turn, uh, if a few months later, the IPCC then then uh, very kindly recognized the several hundred of people who've been involved in the process up to that time, uh, and I was one of these several hundred. So, so if I could say I'm, uh, I can only say that I'm a fractional owner of a, of a Peace Prize, kind of like fractional timeshare, you know, so anyway. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, my talk will be about, uh, a little bit about science. Um, not that you, you probably have heard of it all before, and in fact, the latest report I came out on November 2nd, uh, basically says and repeat a lot of the same findings in the last year. Uh, but I will also talk, touch, touch, about, touch on about um, the whole UN process. The IPCC itself is the United Nations process. It's sort of a subsidiary pro process, if you can think of it that way. But the, uh, the UN Framework Convention process, the UNFCCC, and I know I'm using a lot of alphabets here, but the UNFCCC process is the formal negotiations between countries, and I'll touch on that too, because that will have some bearing on, uh, on how climate change will, is dealt with. I'm very glad to see all the things that we do right here in Kern County, I'm very excited to see that. At the global level, at the uh, international, or even between 
nations kind of uh, level, there's a whole different dynamics that's going on that's, um, that, that I want to touch upon and, and describe to you because I don't think many people hear that. And, and, and I've been observing that for about uh, 15 years now. So, so I can give you a little bit of benefit of my experience in observing uh, these processes. Uh, so anyway, let me, um, let me move on. I think I've talked about that. that uh, that's actually the replica of the Peace Prize, uh, and the IPCC made a replica of it, and, and uh, so I was sent a copy of it. Like I said, a timeshare, fractional timeshare. Um, so anyway, uh, Chevron, of course, uh, uh, just a little bit of advertising, and make sure you know where I come from. I am from Chevron Corporation. Uh, I, I came here from San Ramon, drove down here yesterday. Uh, we are a global company. Uh, we're very proud to be uh, the, uh, really the, the California company. Uh, our presence is global. Uh, and we're in over, you know, across six continents, uh, 40 countries. I won't go into any detail here, but uh, a lot of this is upstream and gas operations. But of course, uh, around the world, we're also very well known as an integrated oil and gas company. We have a downstream, well, upstream gas, midstream, and we have a downstream operation. Uh, lots of uh, uh, sales of, uh, of our products, uh, refineries and products, and uh, lubricants, chemicals, um, a very huge supp supply train across the world. And uh, those, those of you who travel uh, a lot in Asia or maybe in uh, parts of Africa, uh, Caltex is our brand. Austra Australia, too, uh, uh, Caltex is our brand. So Texaco, Chevron, and, oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so, so that's Chevron. So you know us as Chevron and Texaco and Caltex all over the world. Now, this, now come, come back to what I've uh, been doing for, um, for about 15 years. Um, I've been, yeah, actually I've been with the company uh, for, uh, for 21 years. So at first, all, my whole job was focused on the United States. And then in 1998, um, for five years, uh, I was doing Clean Air Act issues. So it's all about criteria, health pollutants, hazardous air pollutants, and all that. Um, but uh, five years into my, my career with uh, Texaco and Chevron, uh, really, it, uh, somebody came to me from the in Indonesian business unit. Okay, this is uh, part of a company that was dealing with upstream uh, oil and gas. And uh, the manager of that unit asked, wanted to find out what the heck is going on with Exxon. Why are they wanting to inject so much CO2 into this Natuna Sea right off of the uh, uh, coast of, uh, uh, of uh, Sumatra? Why do they want to do that? Uh, so the CO2 injection, CO2 capture and storage. This was in 1998. This was in January of 1998. And the significance of that is because in 1997, December, that's when the Kyoto Protocol, part of this negotiation process I talked about, was actually signed. So. It was famously signed by Vice President Al Gore, uh, uh, who flew, flew there overnight and basically negotiated the, um, the agreement. Um, so that's a long way of telling you that, uh, that, that, that I, I got into this because of the business and the competitiveness impact, what Exxon was trying to do, and the technology. Uh, we, we wanted to find out what the heck is Exxon thinking of in capturing CO2 and wanting to inject CO2. Uh, into the ocean, uh, and actually into the seabed, not into the ocean, but into the seabed. And also, what is this thing called the Kyoto Protocol? So that's what started me on this whole uh, journey of, um, of being in the IPCC and also observing the UN negotiation, UNFCCC. So the IPCC in the latest assessment, or the fifth assessment, this is the fifth round, uh, after about uh, six years, six, seven years of time, uh, came up with uh, three working group reports and then in November, on November 2nd, they released the, uh, the synthesis report of the fifth assessment. And that basically spells out a lot of the same uh, findings that they've had in the last several years now. That the, uh, uh, the warming of the Earth system is uh, unequivocal, is, is basically is very clear. Uh, man's contribution to that is also very clear, and it's extremely likely. Uh, there are issues still with uncertainties in uh, how uh, how much temperature will rise if the, the amount of CO2 is actually doubled in the atmosphere. So that uh, so-called climate sensitivity is still very much 
a, a very active area of research. In fact, it is several areas of research that contribute to understanding of this climate se sensitivity. So that's still being, um, being um, very actively researched. Uh, but at the same time, warming is here. Okay, there is no cooling. Okay, there is perhaps a uh, a pause, as as uh, as is reported widely by scientific community, and the scientific community is fully aware of it. There is a pause, but what's causing that pause is still uh, also actively researched, and that's all part of climate sensitivity. A lot of the uh, current science and current results point to the ocean, and um, and I'll and I'll explain that, of course. Uh, quickly, because uh, the ocean, as you know, water has a much higher heat capacity for heat for holding heat than the atmosphere than the air, uh, and so it's uh, at least uh, so. So a lot of the heat is going into the ocean. Now, uh, the warming also it's uh, is unequivocal because it is not just confined to like one region or one country. It is all over the world, and it is varied. And this is uh, from the full sets, like three or four sets of independent data sets. Uh, from 1901 to 2012. So a lot of this is not what you hear or what you see in the online in your, in your CNN app or BBC app or whatever, but a lot of this is in the report, and the report is over a thousand pages for each of the working groups, that, that uh, the, each of the three working groups that produces the report. So you have 3,000 pages of, of science that comes out every several years. And the synthesis report itself is over 120 pages. Um, so. Anyway, so there's a lot of things uh, in this that I cannot cover in this time. I have nine minutes and 51 seconds, okay? So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, CO2, now not just temperature, okay? The, uh, the composition of the atmosphere is also changing. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of science in, the, in these reports too. This is not well covered by any of the media, mainstream or otherwise. Uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, media does, probably just goes over the head. Uh, the composition of the atmosphere is actually changing. These are trace gases, okay, mind you. They are trace, they are in the parts per million range. But the amount of CO2 is at 400 parts per million now. That's the highest any time in, the, in, the, in recorded history and certainly uh, even goes as far back as what our ice core records from Antarctica and Greenland and um, uh, both poles are showing. That roughly 800,000 years, uh, it's 400 parts per million is the highest any time in that 800,000 years. And, and other gases too, methane, that's part of natural gas, of course. Methane and um, nitrous oxide, those are, have, have a strong human uh, source to them as well. Those have also increased. I don't have a graphic here, uh, but certainly you can find that anywhere. Uh, those have also increased at roughly the same time as the trend of CO2 starting around the um, mid 1800s when the first steam engine, of course, was invented by James Watt. So, so the Industrial Revolution does coincide with the rise of methane, N2O2, uh, sorry, uh, nitrous oxide, and uh, uh, N2O, and, um, and CO2. Uh, so that's another indirect uh, uh, attribution to um, man's, man's causes. Uh, so the c composition of the atmosphere is changing. Oh, and what's, uh, what's not also well covered and I don't have it here, is that the, the amount of uh, oxygen, and this is not to cause you any alarm or panic, the amount of oxygen in the parts per billion ranges also has consistently declined over the last 30 years. Uh, very small, but it is consistent with theory, uh, with physical, with physics and chemistry. So it is, uh, uh, there is a slight amount of uh, noticeable, measurable uh, decline in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. So temperature is changing, and the actual physical composition of our atmosphere is also changing. And these are other indicators, too, uh, about um, uh, decline of uh, sea ice, uh, uh, rise in sea level. And of course, if the heat is going in the ocean, what's, what's going to happen to the water? Well, you know, it's going to expand, right? So, so a lot of the current sea level rise is attributable to thermal expansion of the ocean, and that's what's happening. But the models are not very good at this point, still not very good at forecasting or predicting the dynamics of ice sheets uh, from, uh, from Greenland or the Arctic. Um, and certainly not very good in even the talking about the sea ice well, around the Antar Antarctic, how that becomes much more of a maximum. So anyway, so these are, um, so there are consistent indicators. And of course, as it gets warmer in most of the world, you also have hold more water vapor. 
And the more water vapor you get, uh, the more chances of heavy precipitation. That's also been observed in the last two decades. Uh, uh, more frequency of heavy pre uh, precipitation events, uh, in the, especially in the United States, in the northeast part, northeastern part of the U.S. Okay, <clears throat> enough about the science. Uh, that's that's to just give you a flavor of uh, over 3,000 pages of uh, of assessment. Um, but but this is actually what people do. Okay, in rooms like this of this size, or even smaller or bigger. In rooms of this size, countries actually do get together in, the, uh, in, in you know, 20 or 30 countries, but in plenary, uh, there's over 100 countries in these UN negotiations. So in a room of this size, they would have a screen just like that. Uh, they put up words. They put up words on a screen, and uh, 20 to 30 countries would actually uh, make interventions and actually negotiate over, over time. Excuse me. There's a fly, pesky little fly flying around me. So anyway, uh, and this is, what, uh, this is what they do. This is what people actually do. Not in nice tables like this with, dinner ser with lunch served and all that, but, but really in rows of, of chairs and actually sitting for hours, for, literally for hours, um, discussing the text of a treaty. Okay? And, and this text of a treaty has over 70 issues. Uh, in the last round has over 70, 75 issues, in fact, um, that had to be decided. And this is a very human process. This is about negotiation, about negotiating a treaty that, would, that could, in the future, limit greenhouse gas emissions or not. Okay, so, so that's how, how things are actually done. I just want to give you that flavor because uh, I, I don't think the newspaper covered those things. Um, and just uh, this morning, I received an email from uh, lots of business colleagues about the U.S. and China agreement that would limit, that would actually, uh, between the two countries, it really, literally is a bilateral agreement at this point, uh, th that would, the two countries would actually agree to take action. And I think the U.S. had uh, said something about uh, committing to, uh, by the year 2025, uh, t roughly 26 to 28 percent below uh, 2005 level of emissions. So that's what the U.S. has put up on the table and, and agreed to. And China, just yesterday, also agreed to, uh, to continue to limit its uh, emission intensity per GDP, per dollars of gross domestic product. Okay, so they would agree to, to uh, limit their, um, um, their intensity of their uh, carbon emissions from the economy and would also work towards uh, uh, peaking the, the amount of emissions peaking year around 2030. So that's what they have tentatively agreed to between the countries, between the president of U.S. and, uh, and the uh, head of China, the president of China's uh, Xi Jinping. So, so that was just announced yesterday because uh, Obama is over there in China with a lot of the Asian uh, countries leader. The, I think it's the APEC meeting. Uh, oh, and I should say that the, uh, in 2009, the, these political leaders have actually agreed to uh, try to limit the amount of temperature rise since the Industrial Revolution, since the Industrial Rev Revolution to two degrees rise. Now, whether that's achievable or not, that's up to uh, the countries, and, um, and that's, that's really, a, it's gonna be a big debate. Okay, so, but that's what they have agreed to since 2009, so we'll watch that space. Okay, I have less than three minutes. So again, just to uh, draw you, uh, t your attention, the human process of this, is that it is a very human process. This is late night in Durban. I wasn't there that late at night, but I was there until midnight. But uh, these people stayed for 72 hours after the deadline was passed on a, on a mon actually Sunday morning, 3 a.m. Sunday morning, and they were still haggling over one page of, of text. And they were haggling over the two words, commitment or contribution. You see the difference, contribution or commitment. So commitment would be a much stronger word and contribution is less. So they were haggling over that. Eventually they, they used the word contribution. Okay, so you know where the countries are heading. The countries are all protecting themselves and their natural, national interests in this whole issue. So, so while we are, I'm very excited and proud of all the things we're doing in Kern County, in the international level, when countries meet, they secure and protect their national interests as is normally done, I think governments want to protect their own national interests. 
Okay, uh, Chevron is taking a lot of actions. Okay, so this, in spite of all this, and in, or maybe in the context of all this, as a business, we still have to take action. We have to monitor what's going on, what's coming down in policy, but also we're also voluntarily taking action as well to uh, try to stay ahead as much as we can in a business-driven sense, uh, ahead of the game, to try to uh, be prepared for the future. So we've had a four-fold action plan uh, since 2002, and we've had uh, revised our policies on uh, climate change principles. There's not too many things new, uh, new in there, but we have now four new principles. I'll briefly describe those. Uh, uh, let, let me just skip through this. There are a lot of actions going on in, around the world on policies, but we want to be sure as a, as a corporation, as a global enterprise, that we're taking actions in a coordinated fashion here in California or in the US or across the world. So we have to be sure that when we comply or when we take voluntary action, they're at the lowest cost. Okay? Our shareholders demand it. Uh, our four principles are these, global engagement. Countries really do need to uh, globally engage, especially the highest emitting countries in the world. So we see US and China taking action, EU, other countries. Uh, policies have to be balanced and measured. We, we, we understand and we want to, uh, policymakers to understand that fossil fuels is here to stay at the same time as we develop renewable energy and other energy sources. So that's very clear. Uh, we're doing research innovation technology ourselves and certainly policy needs to be transparent. The costs of any policy need to be conveyed openly and clearly to consumers and to voters. And we use specific tools to uh, try to forecast the carbon price. As we all know, forecasting is always wrong. You know, the year later is always wrong, but we still, <laughs> we still engage in that discussion because the value of any forecasting is really the discussion across the company about what we see and, and how we uh, kind of socialize that knowledge amongst the staff and executive management so that people are aware. It's really the discussion that's most valuable. Um, and we have tools within the company. I can't show you any of the tools, but. Be, believe me, we have lots of uh, tools and processes, as a major company uh, does, uh, to uh, consider this issue and when we build projects and make decisions on making capital investments. Uh, we've, uh, because of all the tools and processes over the last uh, 13 years, we have kept our emissions to roughly 60 million tons despite or in, or in spite of all the changes that we've had and even growth in our businesses. So we've roughly kept it to 60 million tons, even on a slight decline in the last couple of years, 57, 56 million tons of emissions. Just to give you a sense of scale, about 56 million tons, 60 million tons is the size of emissions from a country, small country uh, uh, like Austria or like a country of Singapore. Okay, so, so, so we have roughly that kind of magnitude of emissions. Um, uh, energy efficiency, very important to us. I know I ran out of time already. So, let me just say that uh, the previous speaker, Dan Riker, talked about carbon capture and storage. We are uh, very much into researching and developing uh, carbon capture and storage, but not only that, we are actually building one. Um, many of you might have heard, or maybe you haven't heard, uh, in the Western uh, Australia, in the, uh, in the state of Western Australia, we have this huge uh, liquefied natural gas project that will sell a lot of natural gas to the Asian uh, market. But at the same time, we are capturing three and a half to maybe even roughly four million tons of carbon dioxide. Think about that, three and a half to four million tons per year of carbon dioxide uh, will be injected into uh, geologic formation into the ground. This is not used to do any kind of enhanced oil recovery or anything like that. This is simple storage, simple, um, even in Australian uh, context, it's called disposal of uh, CO2 into the ground. So we, we're doing that, we're not just researching it, we are doing some research as well, but we're actually doing this commercially, okay? And, th and by 2016, when this project fully comes online, we will be the largest CO2 capture and storage project in the world. Um, let me just right, get right to Kern County, right here in Kern County, we're doing a lot of things to, um, certainly to uh, minimize our emissions. We have staff here, I know, in our engineering operations and uh, our environmental group who are doing the best every day to, um, to reduce or at least maintain a small environmental footprint, especially energy efficiency. Uh, you've heard about, a lot about steam generation for EOR. We do it very efficiently um, to generate that steam. 
And also in terms of water, uh, these days we have, uh, of course, we have a drought in the last several years now. So we have been uh, sharing a lot of that uh, uh, treated water with the Coelho, uh, uh, water, uh, Coelho Water District. Uh, one third of our water is regenerated for our own use, but two thirds of that, two thirds of that, about 700,000 barrels of uh, treated water is, is sold to, uh, to Coelho Water District, but sold at cost only, really the cost to just uh, recover for our transportation costs. So it's, uh, we're doing a lot of things around the world, but I do want to highlight the fact that at Kern County, we're doing something hopefully uh, very valuable to the many farmers, uh, I think over 150 farmers uh, here in Kern County. So, and I think they appreciate it. So thank you. Well, thanks, Arthur. And I think we have the Farm Bureau here, right? B, are you out there? She probably stepped out to make a call. Um, you know, uh, I, I introduced Arthur as Arthur Clark, Sir Arthur Clark, right? The esteemed uh, author of 2001 Space Odyssey. I apologize to uh, Arthur Lee, although one day I'm confident you will be a sir. Um, next, uh, by the way, uh, we have a raffle at the end, so if, if you leave, and your name's called, you're out of luck. And I, uh, Jeannie, are we giving out a car then, or three cars? Is this Oprah or something? Um, okay, well, 